Professor Eric Vermetten, MD and PhD, is a clinical psychiatrist. He is employed as strategic advisor of research at the Military Mental Health Service with the Dutch Ministry of Defense and the ARC National Psychotrauma Center and Leiden University Medical Center. He's done clinical work with uniformed officers suffering from complex PTSD and published over 200 papers on stress, trauma, complex PTSD and neuroscience. He's open to novel approaches in mental health, combining technology as well as novel, uh, novel pharmacotherapies, including psychedelics. Dr. Vermetten's lecture will present a heat map of the different compounds used in psychedelic psychotherapy, discussing the rationale administration, setting, and evidence in treatment of PTSD. I'm looking forward for your lecture. Dr. Eric Vermetten, welcome. It's, it is a pleasure to be here and, um, and uh, also to, to talk to you and, and to be next to, to Torsten who sort of gave you an overview of the, the beautiful history of, of MDMA. And what I will do is um, sort of meander in, in this topic, uh, also of my interest, and um, I have given myself a title towards a heat map of psychedelics in the treatment of PTSD. But I'll start with sort of a, a sort of a, an, a, since I have an hour, and it's beautiful to have an hour of, 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 and it goes so quickly, I know that, but nevertheless, in the beginning, it feels like you have a lot of time. Um, this is a picture I do want to show to you because it represents where, I, where I'm from. And maybe you do not recognize this picture, and Lisa, you, you know, because yesterday I taught at the military academy or the military defense, and I showed this picture also to familiarize where I'm from, is from a country that has been at war, or in war, has been actually occupied by the Germans for, for five years. And now we're sort of on the, on the rise of commemorating Market Garden, that was 75 years ago, and our country was liberated almost five, 75 years ago. In May, it'll be liberated 75 years ago. I, I'm born in 61, so I have no memory of having been in that war, but my parents were. And my parents were born in uh, 1931, and this picture was taken in 1945, when our country was liberated. It had, be, had been under German occupation for five years. And what I want to show, this picture is taken on the day of liberation, you see a tulip there. I think if I have a pointer here, I see tulip here. And you see, maybe you don't see it very well, you see Canada here. We were liberated by the Poles and, and liberated by the Canadians. The town that I grew up, Reda, were liberated by these two countries. And, um, but the country, the country was liberated, but um, for many people, the war was not over when our country was liberated. And the war kept going on in, in the houses and at the kitchen tables, and, uh, and in small talks. And uh, I grew up in a family where the war was over, but the war was not really over. It sort of was under the skin of my parents and of many people who have survived the war. It may drive why there is such a high density of psychotraumatologists and such a high density of psychotraumatology in the Netherlands. Not only because of that, but maybe the fact that we have been occupied and we sort of embrace that social climate that we look after each other and that density of, 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 of struggling and to hold each other has been reflected actually in a paper that Miranda Olf and myself wrote on why we have such a density of psychotrauma. But also, we live in the lowlands in the Netherlands. Like, if we don't have dikes or so, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be gone. So there, there are other reasons why our country is, is sort of facing with we need to hold each other. Now, if we look at um, the topic, which is uh, PTSD and psychotraumatology, we can see that um, PTSD, as we now call the disorder at stake, has been uh, named differently across many decades. And what you see here is um, a name that we're all very well familiar with, shell shock the First World War, another world war that a lot of soldiers came back from if you didn't, if you didn't, if, if you didn't die in the war because there was many fatalities, then you could, you could well be affected with shell shock. Or as the Germans called it, the Zitterneurosis. 
because the, 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 it was a sort of, and, and Torsten, you may know that, that, that Cetorose was a sort of a, it was, it was a movement disorder, it was a, it was a dyskinesia disorder, but also a neurotic disorder, because you had to sort of internalize the conflict that you took home. The, the French called it le froid de la mort, you'd seen death in the eyes. And just not to go over all the details in this slide, but now since 1980, we have decided that if people have been exposed to war or other potentially traumatic events and have symptoms, then they can be diagnosed with PTSD since 1980 in the DSM-3. And you see other uh, blue names, post-Vietnam syndrome here, uh, combat fatigue, concentration camp syndrome, and you also see moral injury. Maybe the half-life of PTSD, what is the half-life of PTSD? How long can we hold on to PTSD? Is there another disorder that's on the verge or so? And, and, and when and what is that disorder? And you see, I, I think you see that here too, or internationally, moral injury. Is that a new disorder or what is really moral injury? Moral injury is a disorder probably that is related to guilt and shame. It doesn't only occur in wartime, but also in sexual abuse. And guilt and shame are drivers for chronicity in PTSD in a lot of cases. And moral injury may be a name that embraces a new kind of disorder that we don't really know what it is, but you see it more reflected in literature. This is me too, as I typically wear the uniform uh, when, I, when I go to work, or not typically, I do wear the uniform when I need to be a representative. And, um, I, I'm in the military for like now 15 years or so, so most of my patients are uh, veterans or active duty soldiers that have been going to war on a deployment outside of our country. And uh, these are some reminiscences. So this is a, a picture of one of my patients who is representing, drawing his nightmare that, that he sees the child running to the base and he sort of, and that's his hand reaching out to the child that he cannot, he cannot protect. Or, or the, 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 the women of Srebrenica and the women of Bosnia that are, that are crying for their deceased family members. And uh, there's uh, one of my patients who was at Pochichari, where he was talking to the children at the gate of Pochichari, and he knew later on there was a massacre of 8,000 Bosnians who were killed. And those are just some reflections of the caseload of the patients that bring them to my offices. Or office, I should say. Now, a cliffhanger to what I just told you, our country has been... Um, affected by the Second World War, and so were a lot of people who survived the war, and the war didn't end uh, in 1945, and a lot of people, and first, the first couple of years after the war, we were, we were trying to rebuild the country, we were rebuild houses, and rebuild the infrastructure, and rebuild the infrastructure, and rebuild the infrastructure, but there was also, later, it started to be acknowledged that there were people who were affected by the disorder. And, and what treatments did we have at our hands? It was long before PTSD. And there was a psychiatrist named Jan Bastians. Who has heard of Jan Bastians here in the audience? Few people have heard of Bastians. Jan Bastians was a professor of psychiatry at Leiden University. And he was dealing with, uh, he was first in Amsterdam, the Psycholytic Institute, and he went to Leiden. And he was struggling with how can we help cope these people with what we call at that time concentration camp syndrome. Concentration camp syndrome, you survived concentration camp, but you couldn't get rid of the memories. You tried to put them in the drawer, you put, tried to put away the affect or so, but the affect would haunt you at night. And what he did, he was using LSD as a treatment for the concentration camp syndrome, LSD. So that was long before our current days where we were talking about MDMA and other psychedelics. And uh, classrooms were full of, of, of students to talk about LSD and talk about what the impact was of LSD and how you could use LSD in your psychiatric practice. He won prizes, he won royal prizes, the highest royal prize that we had uh, in, in the Netherlands for his work with the resistance fighters and people who survived the war. And then what he did, he was using this kind of provocative way or using LSD, showing showing signs and symbols to try to give the memories back to the people who tried to suppress them. And only, not only the memories, but also the affect that belonged. And he wrote this beautiful book in 1986. It's in Dutch. 
Isolement and bevrijding. It means isolation and liberation. Like isolation, a lot of people are still isolated. A lot of people with PTSD are isolated. They feel disconnected from the world. And they feel alone, and they don't belong to the world anymore. They don't trust anybody anymore. So, so isolation and liberation open up to the world and be connected again. That's the book that he wrote. Now, what I'll show you briefly is what did, a cell, what did a session with LSD look like in those days? This was, when was this? This was a film by Louis van Gasteren, and it was shot in 1969. And where were we in 1969? That's 50 years ago. So what was a session with LSD 50 years ago? I'll just give you a brief snapshot of what a session looked like. So I won't show you the whole thing, but I'll show you that little snapshot here. He's given the first dose of LSD. This patient has been at a concentration camp for four years. Now, what was interesting was that after war was over, and after he came back from the war, his affect had disappeared. His was sort of an instrumental relationship to his wife, and they had three children, but the affect was gone out of his life. And what he tried to do with LSD, tried to bring the affect back. This is a little bit later in the session. Let's say an hour, an hour and a half later. Normale 
LSD is kind of a hard drug, hard drug in a way that the affect really hits you very hard. So it's different than what you just heard Torsten say. That's a softer drug. Oxytocinergic drive gives you a connection to the world, and it's much more soft. So he gets hit by the affect in a, in a very, very, well, no, I wouldn't say negative way, but a kind of a tough, rough way. I'll just show you one, one clip which is number five here. Like, how do you, because that's the essence of psychotherapy, once you're struck or connected or confronted with that affect, how do you reintegrate that in your normal life? So it's not the LSD, it's the reintegration later or during the session or the end of the session, how you reintegrate that and how you put it into perspective. Let's look at how he tries to talk about starting to do that. <laughs> away it goes away when you die it's a sad part there right but how can you integrate this in such a way that your life can be better tolerable and the last that I didn't show you and there's so much more to say about this that because you want to have symptom relief but you can't take away the memories you can't take away the memories of the war so you have to have a way to tolerate and to better deal with the memories of whatever hotspot that there has been. There's much more to say about this, and the problem a little bit with Bastian's is, and his work is, as some called it, the Bastian's method of drug-assisted therapy, that he didn't write enough about his method. There's only a few anecdotal reports, while his whole life was devoted to, to these kinds of treatments, and he didn't only use LSD, but he used pentatol, pentobarbital, and other compounds, and this is an enormous rich repertoire of experience. I'm very much, uh, incentivized by Bastian's, how he did this, and how at that time frame was pioneering with these difficult uh, scenarios to try to, to treat these patients. There's actually a MAPS-sponsored study later by some residents that tried to find way, people who've been treated by Bastian's and have them reflect on how much impact the Bastian's method had on their lives. And uh, you can, I uh, don't have to read all the details, but some people feel that, um, they say, well, I had less sleeping problems and less anxieties. It provided me with insight into what bothered me from the past. I could live a normal life again. Since then, I've, made, I've had no more depression. I felt greatly improved. My aggressive behavior slowly disappeared, and I'm calm now and can talk about the past. Now, part of this, but also part that he's in Leiden, and he was a professor of psychiatry at Leiden, and I'm a professor of psychiatry at Leiden, feels that I'm a kind of, Bastian is a big, tall man, <laughs> and I'm a kind of the, the smaller <laughs> impersonization of, of probably of Bastian, as some people called it. So that is the introduction to my talk. So you have an idea where I come from, you have an idea what incentivizes me, and now let's talk about what incentivizes maybe all of us, which is this. There's a growing interest in psychedelics. If we just look at four compounds, ayahuasca is not on here, but we have classical psychedelics, we have LSD and psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, and 
ketamine and cannabinoids. If you look at psychotraumatology, then we can see a rise over the years. If you just, this is not empirical studies. This is just if you Google and then you do a search word or so in PubMed or Scholar One or so, and then you can see a rise. Except for maybe the classical psychedelics and the psychotraumatology lag a little bit behind. But the other three are really, really, um, there's, a, there's a robust interest. Well, let's look at that from a, from a peripheral perspective. I will talk about briefly, I will talk about MDMA. Not a lot on ketamine, but ketamine is very much on the rise. Uh, Janssen, you know, Janssen has just uh, released ketamine as an intranasal spray for depression, and ketamine is a strong antidepressant agent. Now, Janssen is also interested to look at ketamine for the treatment of PTSD. And there's, it's been years since any interest, industry was interested in looking at a novel drug for the treatment of PTSD. So ketamine is very interesting. Classical psychedelics, but not that much, but there's also some of the interest. Actually, we're doing a psilocybin study at Leiden University right now for treatment of depression in, in, um, in Utrecht and in Groningen, umbrellaed by Compass, who is looking at a three-arm study, one milligram, 10 milligram, 25 milligrams, looking at depression, ultra-resistant depression. Maybe it carries over to PTSD as well, if we look at that. And then cannabis, medical marijuana. We make medical marijuana in the Netherlands. We have, a, we have an industry, we export it. Uh, uh, we export it internationally. Canada is a big, a big producer of, of medical marijuana, as well as, in, in, as Israel. It's a very interesting compound. For the last two years, I've been treating my patients with medical marijuana, oral or, I don't like to give them the, the smoke version, the, the, the floss, but uh, some prefer to smoke it. And I have gained some expertise now in what, what the pros and the cons are of medical marijuana for the treatment of PTSD. But if we look at the, what's available, you can see marijuana is legal for me medical purposes already in the US. I mean, there's a renaissance in 33 states. It's interesting. And how does that move? Colombia is turning into a major American marijuana producer. They go, they go from cocaine to, mar to marijuana. Switzerland aims to legalize medical marijuana. The Netherlands is to expand cannabis production, potentially creating competition for Bedrocon. Bedrocon is our company that is making the, and it's a stable product. It's not like you grow it and you get TAC, CBD all over the place. Notice it's a very stable, very stable uh, product. And we have, you know, we have uh, Cusson, we have uh, in systems, growing systems where the temperature and everything's controlled. The, the Dutch are very good at that. Magic mushrooms show promising results for treating PTSD and depression. The psychedelic evangelist, a German financier, wants to turn magic mushrooms into modern medicine. If you look at it, who, 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 who in, in, uh, ignites this renaissance? Who does that? Does the government do that or so? No, the government is not funding all this. These are private entrepreneurs. People from Uber or from, from Groupon. Or, or people who just become rich because of they've done something. And they've, they've, like, there's a guy from Uber who's, who, who who made a lot of money because Uber went to the stock market, and he's now sitting on a lot of, mo a lot of money. And of course, they want to remove plastic from the ocean. That's, that's a really a good, good purpose. But he said, I want to do more than that. I also want to do something else. And maybe some of the people have had their personal experience and feel like that has changed me to such an extent, I'm devoting my money to promoting this kind of research. Why block the promise of a psychedelic renaissance? A multi-million dollar donation just created a bonanza of magic mushroom research. Ketamine, a novel drug for anxiety and depression. Will ketamine be a breakthrough drug for PTSD? And these are just recent, this is January 14, 2019. This is just recently posted on, on various websites. Is ketamine boom getting out of hand? There's a lot of ketamine clinics in the US. A lot of people feel this is a money-making industry, so I, I buy some ketamine, I have an anesthesiologist, and I give some people ketamine, and then I'll let them go. I don't think that that will fly. Psychotherapy is something that you have to do and not just let ketamine do its thing, so it'll, it'll get down, downhill, downhill as well soon. Ho I, I hope not, but... Um, MDMA has a breakthrough Therapy assignment for PTSD, the FDA gave that, and I'll tell you why. MDMA or ecstasy shows promises a PTSD treatment. That's August 21st, 2019. And a guy who's doing a lot of research, has done a lot of research, David Nutt at Imperial College. 
in London, the use of MDMA for PTSD. If you look at David Nutt and Google him or so, he has this beautiful website where he has all these, these background, if you want to have some education, psychoeducational uh, material, then he provides it online. It's beautiful, uh, beautiful um, uh, uh, points. And he has a Twitter account where he gives every, every now and then. And you know, he's a colleague of Ben Sessa, and Ben Sessa was here next year, so they're, they're kind of in, the in the same boat. And um, the world's first center for psychedelic research opens in the UK. This is Robin Kathy Harris. They've been just given four million to start the first psychedelic clinic in the UK. And Robin Kathy Harris is just not a clinician per se, but he looks at it, like Torsten said, from a, from a brain research perspective. How can we learn from the brain, or what can we learn from the brain? What, what is the psychedelic state? What does the brain look like when somebody's under LSD? And how is the entropy represented in the brain? Or is the brain connected, wired in a different way when we're under? We have to ask these questions because they can give us breakthroughs in understanding consciousness. Have you, have you heard about Michael Pollan? Who's, who's heard of Mike? Oh, wow, you see, yeah. I asked the qu same question to, um, where was I just recently? Uh, oh, in the Netherlands, actually, a group of psychiatrists, and only three or so, or four in the audience, the same audience, had heard of Michael Pollan. It's a book you have to read, and, and I don't have to be an evangelist here. It's a very beautiful book on how to change your mind. Paul Stamets is another one, if you're interested in mushrooms and psilocybin. He has a whole evolutionary approach to understanding how psilocybin and mushrooms help to wire and to understand how we are humans. And this one you have to also, who, who's, who's not yet seen, who has, no, the other way around, who has not seen this video, this YouTube from, who has not seen it, who's not seen it, wow, okay. Look at, look at Rick Doblin, and look at the TED talk of Rick Doblin, who's just posted it, uh, April 2019, it's been viewed 1.6 million times, it's about the future psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, it's 15 minutes, and just give it away, forward it to somebody else, or so it's a beautiful talk, and this guy has really revolutionized, or so it's really the, the powerhouse of, of doing this research and a fundraiser, and he's a, he's a wonderful guy as well. John Hopkins opened the Center of Psychedelic Research. They've just been donated 17 million. And where does the 17 million come from? From a private donation. <laughs> Somebody who's really been keen in, in driving this. And these are the two guys that are uh, launching the Center of Psychedelics. So, so we're in a good situation. We have money, we have academic interest, and, and you see there's a lot of positive, positive um, uh, material. And this one, David Nickel, who's been around for years, and Matthew Johnson from, uh, from Hopkins, wrote this paper, Psychedelics as Medicine, an Emerging New Paradigm. Maybe we have to think about, it. our measurements need to change or so, the way we look at the brain. Also, we have to new, have new methods of looking at at neuroscience, and maybe this is a way of, of looking at the brain from Robin Catherine Harris that under psilocybin is just a way of visualizing that the connections between neurons is differently under placebo or psilocybin. This is Robin Catherine Harris, wrote a beautiful paper, just recently came out towards unified model of brain action for psychedelics. But maybe this is a word that actually it's, do you know the word disruptive? A lot of disruptive technologies come from Silicon Valley, right? All these Airbnb and Groupon and stuff, they are disruptive technologies. But we can also translate that word disruptive to disruptive psychopharmacology. A new way to look at psychopharmacology. And actually it's a paper written by Boris Heifetz and Robert Malenka from, uh, he's an anesthesiologist from Stanford University. It's a beautiful brief paper that just came out in um, JAMA Psychiatry. And they call this disruptive psychopharmacology. And when you look at the mechanism of action, we have typically our old-fashioned ways of looking at drugs from a molecular biological perspective. But they say, well, maybe you have to look at a different way of understanding how these drugs work. And here they say, uh, it's telling the current wave Oops, it's telling that the current wave of therapeutic innovation is based not on insights gained from studies established drugs, but rather on a disruptive new therapeutic approach involving compounds that have been known for quite some time over other contexts. Now, it's not solved by one paper that has a new name for something, but a new way of looking at processes. And then it gets out of hand, right? And then Trump gets it. Is it fake news or something? Trump orders a lot of ketamine for depressed veterans. Uh, the high, high prevalence of veterans in the U.S. and suicide is, is pretty high still. It's really a problem. 
And then Trump says that the uh, VA needs to buy the controversial antidepressant in an effort to stem veteran suicide. I hope that that's fake news. In a way, it's double. It's, it's a little bit double. So, so what drove me into this is, yes, this is fun or so and nice to talk about, but what really drove me is actually this paper. And this is a paper uh, by John Crystal. I was studying at Yale years ago, and John Crystal is now the department chair at Yale University, and he wrote a paper with this title. It is time to address the crisis in the, psychopharma in the pharmacotherapy of PTSD. It is time to address the crisis in the pharmacotherapy of PTSD. So, is there a crisis in the pharmacotherapy of PTSD? Well, there's only two medications that are approved for the treatment of PTSD. And these are paroxetine and sertraline. And when did we approve those? In 2001. So for the last 16 or 17 years, there have been no new drugs that have been tested or found effective for PTSD. So that's a long time. And part of that is driven by the fact that the industry has backed away. I mean, the industry that's there in CNS is um, Janssen and maybe um, Lundbeck. Uh, but a lot of companies have moved to vaccines because there's much more money to make, or other domains. CNS is sort of bad, and there are no, no really new compounds that are in the pipeline. You know, really new compounds. We're making small modifications of stuff. And we have compounds from the old days, so... so what their recommendations are, we need, to, we need to look at that. This is a serious problem for a disorder that is so prevalent. So what they did, and this is John Crystal. Oh, this is, these are all the drugs that we use. You, well, one of your comments could say, well, but we're using drugs for PTSD. Yeah, of course we use a lot of drugs for PTSD. But all of these drugs are off-label. Off-label means that they have been proven to be effective for other disorders. And we use them for treatment PTSD because of symptom relief or so. Or you can say, oh, well, that's what the, what, what the problem or so. Okay, this is a little bit nitty gritty. We don't have drugs really for the treatment of PTSD. The drugs that we do are peroxy and sertraline. These are the only approved drugs. Uh, we use as antidepressants. Another, in, an interesting one that actually we didn't develop because of a theoretical idea was praesazine. I don't know whether you knew. You, oh, it's, <laughs> I got 10 minutes. Um, praesazine. And then we have a lot of benzodiazepines. Well, benzodiazepines do not cure PTSD. They suppress a lot of symptoms. A lot of symptoms are suppressed, but you don't get cured by suppressing symptoms. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this. But then, so, so Torsten told you about the therapeutic use of MDMA in the 80s, that in Switzerland they had a... Had a and, and actually, if you look at that, Bastians looked at LSD in the Netherlands, but in, in California there was a lot, of, a lot of clinical use of MDMA. And it's interesting to look at how did they use it, what, what, is, what was the psychotherapeutic process like when they were using MDMA, psycholytic therapy with MDMA and LSD in Switzerland. So a lot of people were using it. Actually, over a thousand people, therapists were using MDMA in the, in, in sort of the, in the 80s, and maybe, maybe more or so. But why then? Why are we studying MDMA? Because if you look at the guidelines for the treated PTSD, they say we have evidence-based guidelines, which is exposure therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, narrative exposure therapy, CPT. Why, why MDMA? So we recommend individual manualized trauma-focused therapy over other psychopharmacologic and non-pharmacological intervention for the primary treatment of PTSD. All the guidelines say that. So why PTSD? Well, it doesn't always work. In my caseload, I see guys that do not respond well to these evidence-based treatments. Either they drop out or they don't get better. Maybe the driver is guilt and shame, like I referred to earlier. And guilt and shame is not addressed really easily with these exposure-based treatments. They do fear, 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 um, uh, uh, fear um, desensitization, anxiety desensitization. Oh, so what about, and of course you feel, what about a drug that could catalyze psychotherapy? And that could be MDMA. Now, 
the Meethofer studies and, and uh, uh, Thorsten uh, said something about it. The Meethofer studies are, are, are really a driver for all this. And they, they were against mainstream at the beginning. It was really hard to, to get an MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy protocol through the IRB. In November 2001, the first protocol was approved by, by the FDA. And then oh, it took a couple of years before the first participant were enrolled. And in 2016, that's 12 years later, there are six phase two studies that have been completed. And in August 2017, the FDA grants a breakthrough therapy assignment for PTSD. So I don't have to show you this, that MDMA is a beautiful drug, that, that, that a lot of things that happen. And one of the, 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 the researcher, Matthias Lichti, that, that uh, we, we know very well, has, has done a beautiful work in Switzerland on what happens with oxytocin, how quickly does oxytocin emerge, and, and what other, other hormones are there uh, at, the, at the time sequence of MDMA administration. The study design was as follows. You have three experimental sessions with MDMA. Maybe you have seen already or heard about this. And then you have integrative sessions in between. 72 hours of therapy was in the protocol. That's Michael Meehofer. The first result, and you stone briefly one slide with the first result, was this. And, but, but to walk you through briefly, this was the placebo response in the responders in the first study that came out in 2011. This was a placebo response. And you have to understand that the, the detection for PTSD is at 50. If you have a CAPS score over 50, you meet criteria for PTSD. If you have a CAPS score lower than 50, you do not meet criteria for PTSD. You have to bear that in mind. This is DSM-4 for PTSD. So these guys still have PTSD, but did drop in symptom score, right? That's the cutoff. This was the MDMA response. When I saw this for the first time, I felt it's too good to be true. I haven't seen that in a while. This is just fake news or so. It can be, tr it can be, it can be true. But then I, I felt like we have to step on that bandwagon. We have to step on the boat. We have, have to replicate that. There's a moral value. I, I feel a moral value to our veterans. We send them to broad deployment, so we, we bring them home after. So we need to, we need to investigate this. So, so they actually, the beauty of that study was that placebo responders got MDMA after the study was over. It was a, 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 a crossover design. When the placebo responders got MDMA later, they also had a drop off their symptom scores. The long-term follow-up, you could say, well, that's a honeymoon effect or so, right? It's just a, a nice therapist, two therapists, and it's like a lot of time, a lot of a lot of oxytocin or so, but the long-term follow-up was, was, was uh, stable. They didn't relapse after two or three years. And we do see in chronic PTSD that they're relapsing. They did a lot of increased openness, neuroticism, that went down some personality characteristics did respond in a way that we would hypothesize to, 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 to see the, the, the results. Then they did another, one other study was, um, how much do you need to give? So what dose do we give? And, and Torsten said 75, 125 or so. This is a study where they give, a study where they give 75, 30, and 125. And you can see actually 30 milligrams doesn't do the, doesn't do the trick. It is 75 milligram and 125. And maybe 75 milligrams is better. It's a more easeable, tolerable dose. You can, you can speculate on why and stuff, but that's the dose that we're currently working with. And you can look at depression, and you can look at sleep quality, and traumatic growth, and uh, these are the studies that have been done. Six studies with a total intent to treat of 105 patients that have been in this study. And these are all published in major journals, major journals, and that's what the FDA took as, an, as a sort of an encouragement and the evidence to give it the, 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 the assignment, um, uh, breakthrough therapy assignment. This is what the therapy uh, looked like, and, and you know, it's interesting, in our Center 45, the infrastructure needs to be changed. We needed to buy new furniture to make it cozy. In other words, the infrastructure that we had wasn't cozy. We had IKEA chairs, and we had all kinds of things that weren't really nice to have your therapy in. So this is the best therapy room that we have in our, in our, in our and everybody wants to be there. This is the Meethofers. So you've heard Torsten say about the non-directive, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. This is Michael Meethofer. And of course, it's not just 
non-directive, so you don't have to do anything or so. It's a lot of work. You have to be there. Doors of perception are open when somebody's on MDMA. So you have to be there. You have to be the fly that's almost on the skin of the person. You have to see every twinkling, every breath. Hey, there's a slight change or so. What does it want to tell me? So you have to be very, very precise. You don't have to go out. You need to be there. Doors of perception are open. So that's manual. How to do that? How intensive is it? It's eight hours. It's not like 45 minutes. So they wrote about that. Oops, yeah. Well, and because in the interest of time, I won't give you all of this, but I will, sh no. But the, yeah, so this is the setting. And, and uh, there's one person who gave permission to release his video so you can see what this person looked like. This was an Iraqi from a Marine veteran. And um, actually, I'll tell you the, the, the gist of this. This was a Marine veteran who was struggling with a lot of aggression because he couldn't deal with the guilt that he had from seeing his buddy burned in the Bushmaster when he was giving incoming fire at the Iraqi war. So he tried to protect him, but he had to, he had to step out of the Bushmaster and he saw his buddy being burned alive. That induced a lot of guilt. And in order to deal with the guilt, he overcompensated the guilt by being very aggressive, lashing out to his wife, and, and that was what he was dealing with a lot. And, he, and typically, when we revisit these hotspots in a therapy session, there would be a lot of anxiety and a lot of anger coming out. Under MDMA, you don't see that. I'll show you just briefly then one, one clip when he addresses that. If I can. I mean, I know this is um, part of the, uh, you know, part of the drug, but when I try and think, you know, am I going to be able to hold on to this, um, this understanding, this, um, this a lot of wisdom, this knowledge that I have now, mm -hmm. that, I mean, just asking myself that question, I feel like it's so profound that I don't think I could really forget it. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about it now, you know, whenever I, I blow up on people or blow up on my wife and get all, you know, angry and yelling at her, I feel like it's because I kept that person locked up. Mm -hmm. Typically what the Meethofers say, this is a corrective experience a corrective experience, you have the opportunity to look at yourself from a different perspective, a, a tendency to forgive yourself, to step out, to have that psychedelic or psycholithic, and then have a sort of a disembodiment or so, and then reflect, re, 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 um, forgive yourself. So there's the supportive setting, imaginal exposure, cognitive restructuring, a lot of opportunities to look at it. Why, why change? What, what happens that you could use as a as justification for the change? And, and there's many, many, many avenues. Does it facilitate exposure therapy? Is it, does it facilitate CPT? Does it facilitate psychodynamic therapy? Because there's a lot of transference going on as well. You have a male and a female therapist, so you have, you may regress to an earlier infantile state and, and have all these things act out as well at the same time. Now, now this is different than the other exposure-based therapies in PTSD. I listed them here, and they're all pluses and minuses, and MDMA therapy there is different. It's a disruptive approach to the evidence-based therapies that we have. Now, I'm coming to a close. I didn't talk a lot, and I did talk about MDMA, didn't talk a lot about ketamine. I refer to it briefly. It has a lot of potential, but it's a different drug. It's a different approach. It's not as psycholithic as this one, but we're looking at light, and now we're giving the first patient, actually, is enrolling next week, where we're giving over two weeks, we give them three sessions of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy over two courses, and we're doing ketamine-assisted psychotherapy in our way that we feel that is comfortable. It's, of course, there's so much uh, knowledge out there how to do that, but that's, um, we do it our way. <laughs> And I have a PhD student who's writing that. Classical psychedelics, um, cannabis, um, didn't dwell on it, but maybe we could go over the panel to talk about this more. Briefly, and that's the, sort of the wrap-up, is there is a training program by MAPS, and I'm so happy that, that, um, that Tarku is one of the sites that is doing the open-label study, and that, that we have a site in Helsinki. They went through the online, the residential, the self-study, the role-play, the supervision, 
and uh, just some photographs of what, what, what it looks like when you do this, this maps training. You look at videos with any and micro videos and you discuss the videos and you, you, you have every angle. And you have group, group hugs and group dynamic things to have a, an idea. You have music, you have drawing. We went to Niv Shalom in Israel where we trained with the Israelis. Um, music is an important part of MDMA's psychotherapy. So we looked at what role music has and how do you do the music and what types of music. And this is uh, the Dutch team with some other international collaborators uh, in one of our trainings. We actually also disseminate to academia with the Royal Academy of Sciences that we did and uh, with the Dutch Society of Psychiatry where we looked at the different compounds, presented our work. But we have to f sort of fight, we have to counter the public opinion. Like, okay, typically when I give an interview or so, the headlines is, um, uh, the Dutch Minister of Defense is going to use party drug ecstasy to treat veterans. Yeah. Well, okay, it's true, but it's, you have to sort of re redefine that this is a medicine, right? It may come up, but I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch on it. Is, do you have to have your own MDMA session? Yes. I'm a strong proponent to do that. Uh, you don't have to have used all the medications that we're having at use for the treatment of our PTSDs or so, but this one gives you the opportunity to understand what it is to be in that psychedelic state. Now, I, I can, you, can, you can trust me, I was drug naive until I was age 57. I got my own first NDMA session. I could talk a whole afternoon about it. And I don't want to trivialize it. It could be, you can laugh about it. The next page, picture, you will laugh about it. But I won't trivialize it. I didn't have PTSD or so, but I have a life. I have, a, I have parents that I just briefly talked to you about. So, so, so this was after the session. <laughs> So we have set sites, the, we, 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 we are very uh, happy that MAPS is there. MAPS is, is, is uh, facilitating a lot of studies, the phase three in the US and Israel, and we have expanded access in the Netherlands. I'm sort of the ambassador to kind of try to bring, bring the MDMA psychotherapy to Europe. We need money still, even though we have some potential donors. And we have Germany, we have Czech Republic, Finland, Portugal, and the Netherlands as the, uh, as the phase three sites. And that's going well. And probably 2022, 2023 or so, we may have the EMA indication, approved indication for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as another drug-assisted psychotherapy that could be um, used for PTSD. So is it time for a revival or this? Based on the scientific community, yes, it's time for a revival. Based on the interest in the media, yes. Is there any evidence that it's time for a revival? Yes, certainly for MDMA. Is there a need? Yes. Uh, based on your feedback, probably yes. Also interesting is that we may need to reverse translate what happens in therapy to get a better understanding of the psychopathology of PTSD and understand consciousness and the brain. There's a high need for compassionate use, education and research. And just the very last slide is that I do want to acknowledge my team, and I couldn't be here without the support and, and, uh, of, of my team. And you see my team, you see Michael Miethofer and Annie Miethofer, and, and the whole team of Dutch uh, psychotherapists, and you see uh, Rick Doblin, uh, our, our big sponsor and supporter of our studies, and the names are here. And with that, I do thank you for your attention. And this is the European teams that I shall also shoot you, and uh, some of the people will recognize. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, I must repeat that this uh, should have been one and a half hours, but uh, maybe in another universe. Or... So, um, you have treated and studied extreme dissociation conditions like DID. Uh, this is dissociative identity disorder, right? Uh, how does MDMA, in your mind, work with treating these kinds of conditions? Oh, that's a very good question. I think, and we talked about that briefly, I think that um, also what Torsten said, I think you need to have the capacity to integrate these experiences into a self-concept. So you need to have an orientation of ego, ego structure, and a self-concept. When that is disrupted because of a severe disorder like DID, I think it's going to be tough to include DID as a disorder of severe psychotraumatology a severe psychotraumatologic disorder to be used for uh, MDMA. 
as soon as I derp. So I think also for borderline, I think that we're struggling with should we like this dissociate a subtype? I think we're not there yet. Maybe we have to tweak our, our psychotherapy to better better use it. But for now, I think we would be most comfortable with excluding those severe forms like DID and focus on chronicity or PTSD rather than, um, than including those. Um, there's a question regarding CPTSD, which is a complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. CPTSD might often involve more frequent trauma, such as childhood neglect, instead of single events, as in PTSD. Can it be treated the same way with psychedelics? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no hesitation. CPTSD, PTSD, I think that that's the perfect goal. It's perfectly fit for complex PTSD. With the interpersonal trust and dysregulated attachment, it gives you the open, op opportunity to connect again, like you've never been feeling connected or attachment dysregulation. It gives you the opportunity to work on that. So I think that's, uh, that's a perfectly match. Do you think CPTSD would require a lot more sessions than regular PTSD? Well, we don't know that. I don't think so. But um, um, proof of the pudding is in the eating. So I don't know. This question that's uh, gained a lot of upvotes. Regarding the stigma around psychedelics, are treated military personnel allowed to return to active duty afterwards? And also, what is their performance post-treatment? Well, in the, in the military, if you're active, we have a zero tolerance for drugs. So while you're active, you cannot be using drugs. Now, it will be a discussion if you temporarily could be relieved, suspended or so, for a treatment. You can have surgery while you're active. You could have psychotherapy while you're active. If this would be an indication, you could have this indication to be treated with this drug-assisted psychotherapy while you're active. We're not there yet. We first have to show that it is going to be effective. So I would be, I would be a big sponsor or fan to, to use it in veterans and to support the, use, uh, the clinical research in post-active. And once we've seen, once we do see that uh, that is effective as it has been shown by others, then we can have a discussion whether we can also use it as a regular therapeutic approach that could also be used for active duty or for police officers or fire brigades or other uniformed professionals while in duty. Uh, there's a question regarding placebo. I imagine we might also be talking a bit about this in the panel discussion, but uh, still, are the placebo conditions truly comparable to the experimental conditions? One would think that it's very obvious for the patient. So, so again, what is placebo? Uh, yeah, are, are the placebo conditions truly comparable to the experimental conditions? We get that question qu quite a lot, and... Um, um, well, I, I think not. It's not uh, uh, comparable to the active drug competition. We have, for scientific reasons, we have to do that comparison. Um, it just, it's just, it's to let, yeah, I can refer to my own session or so. And of course, I've been giving a placebo and I've been giving an MDMA. And you know, I'm very hypnotizable. I can tell you that to the audience. And when I close my eyes, I'm at the beach. So at my first session, I thought I had been given MDMA. It was so wonderful. It was beautiful. I thought, well, this is MDMA. Everybody needs to have this session. It's beautiful. <laughs> and, and the next day, I came in for my placebo session. And I felt like, well, what, am I, what the hell am I going to talk about? We've had, we've had, I've had my session already. And after half an hour, I felt some change. And I was like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> So, but that's just my subjective, so I couldn't extrapolate that to everybody else. So, that's my belief that it's really different, and, I, and I, I've, I've felt it or so, but... Um, um, so, that's, that's the best I could give now. And for scientific, we have to do the placebo response. And like, uh, like with psilocybin, they do a three-arm response, 1, 10, and 25 or so. It's the rigor that we do have to put in this research, definitely. And we have to find a compound that is... You know, what's the compound that we're using? Has it, uh, what's the name for the compound? No, the other one that uh, that some of the studies are using. It's not niacin. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So was uh, niacin also the placebo in the session for you? No, no. Or it was just what was it? It was a, it was a, what was a placebo? I think it was just a placebo. I, I don't know. <laughs> so it wasn't like a, a small dose MDMA. No, 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 no. It wasn't small dose. No. Yeah, later in the panel, we could readdress that. Um, maybe 
have time for one more question. It's a bit hard to see because the questions keep moving as people up, up and down with them. You want, to hold you want me to hold it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe this one. Could you tell a little bit about your own research plans? What kind of research would you like to do in the future? Oh, we're actually we're doing now the open label. We're preparing with our team uh, the, the, the open label. We're adding a neuroimaging arm. We do that with four sites, so we do neuroimaging before and after, where we want to look at the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex. I did a lot of imaging in, in my earlier life, and so we wanted to see that in MDMA, because all the research that's been done thus far has been on the healthies. So we want to do it in the first 15 subjects. That's one thing that we want to do. We're moving into two arms because we need sponsoring, and the two arms is compassionate use, like they're doing in the US and in, in Israel, and the Ministry of Health in Israel has, has given access to compassionate use. We want to do that too. And also the, the study that we'll hear about later, the conjoint therapy. And also because of strategic uh, way, because we wanted to, um, to not only do phase three trials, but also include other teams to have this experience. And that incentivizes other teams and then to grow bigger because we don't want to limit this to a limited set of teams. We wanted to bring this to a wider area and that it becomes available for other I mean, I, I, there's a lot of interest in when I when I give college to students or so residents. So there's a lot of excitement and a lot of interest. So we have to educate them and also allow them to be using it. And it's still a class one drug, for sure. But if we medicalize it and we get a license at certain sites, clinics to use it, then we need therapists and we need good therapists. So the research agenda that we uh, we have needs to be strong in terms of. Um, maybe working mechanisms, but also uh, other indications, like you heard about autism or so, or not stretching it too wide, but uh, there are other disorders that uh, could also be explored uh, in their uh, effectivity for um, being treated with MDMA. And the approach itself, like, is this the golden standard to have two sessions or so, or three MDMA psychotherapy sessions? Maybe, maybe more, maybe less, or maybe one or so. That, that's, it could be tweaked. The Meethofer protocol at, at this moment is our golden protocol, and we should stick to it until we get our, our EMA approved um, uh, indication, and then we can sort of tweak it. That's a long, long answer. Wonderful. Eric Vermette. Thank you. Thank you.